Hey everybody and welcome to Growth Insights number 14. I know it's been a while, I'm sorry, but I have good excuses. Our team just grew to 60 people, we just moved to three new countries, we launched a growth and AI traineeship, and we launched a new blockchain course. So we have been quite busy, but I do have a very nice episode for you. We're gonna be very top of the funnel this time. I've actually kept my new personal obsession for the very, very last. And by the way, small change based on your feedback. If you'd like to download all of the resources and tools that we mentioned in this episode, follow this link over here, or just go check out the link in the description. Okay, enough boring intro, let's get started. Here's my personal favorite from the past month. This is a curated collection of what some iconic websites looked like in the past. Web Design Museum is like an anthropological study of UX. Check out Apple back in the days, Google's website, or this old version of eBay's website. In line with this, check out this really cool article by CB Insights, where they share the websites of 35 now unicorns before they became big. Special shout out to Magic Leap, who probably had the augmented reality world's least inspiring website of all time. Go and have a look for a few minutes, it's fun. Since we're on the topic of website design, thanks to Julia for sharing possibly the most minimalistic website I've ever seen for a high-end fashion brand. This is the website of Balenciaga, and I've never seen so many squares in my life. And on the polar opposite of this, here is linkscars.com, possibly the world's craziest car leasing website ever. And yes, he is making a killing selling a lot of cars. Still on the subject of user interface, and thanks to Mark for sharing this, this one's a pretty sweet tool. According to Google Images, what is the color scheme of specific words expressions, brands, or websites. So in this example, I'm gonna search Growth Tribe on Picular, and I'm gonna see what the main colors are that come out through Google Images. You can also do this for domains, for example, digital marketing or behavioral psychology. So what I've been doing is I've been cross-referencing these colors with a color wheel of emotions to see if the dominant color is in fact aligned with the emotions that we wanted to create. You can also do this with a landing page or a web page. Thanks to Gino for sharing stylifyme.com. This gives you the fonts and the hex codes of the main colors used on a website. So you could run your website or a specific landing page and see if the colors that come out of it match the tone of voice and the branding of the product you're trying to sell. Now on a completely different subject, here's another little gem from last week. This one sounds like a wrapper, but it's not. It's called deepl.com, which is, believe it or not, a better version of Google Translate. We tested it on a bunch of documents, our latest press release, even some poetry, and it actually outperformed Google Translate in every single test that we've done. It does so well that some companies use its API to directly push articles they've translated into different languages. The only problem is, is they have less languages than Google Translate, of course. Check it out and let us know what you think. Okay, let's jump into the Facebook platform. Check out this latest research by Pew Research. It seems that Americans are starting to actually delete their Facebook accounts. Think about what the implications are for you communicating to customers through Facebook. As with many channels that start to get more complex and start to decay, you need to get more creative and your targeting needs to be a lot more powerful. Now, if you don't have enough traffic for lookalike audiences or if you don't have enough emails for custom audiences, you're gonna wanna do audiences based on interests. Thanks to Julia for sharing this Chrome extension, which is extremely fast and useful to create audiences based on very specific interests. It saves you time and you can go deeper into interests. Now, if you wanna take things even further, thanks to Paco for sharing this tool. This tool allows you to discover thousands of profitable interests Facebook actually hides from the masses. It's basically a more extended version of the Facebook Interest Explorer. Check out the tool and check out this article if you want a step-by-step -step guide on how to actually use the tool. Here's another cool Facebook trick and thanks to Jim for sharing this one. So usually in Facebook, you can only target people within a one mile radius. However, by placing as many exclusion pins as you want, you can target very, very detailed location. For example, in this image, we're only very specifically targeting people who have visited our Amsterdam office. We're soon gonna be testing this with our other offices. Okay, here's the last one on Facebook. In the last episode, we showed you how to very simply see what ads your competitors are running on Facebook. Here's a very similar solution, but for Twitter. Head over here and type their handle into the search box. Funnily enough, we did it for four or five companies we're interested in and found nothing. So is any Anybody actually running Twitter ads? Speaking of competitor spying, did you know you can use Ahrefs to find your competitor's most read pieces of content? Maybe an option is for you to make an even better version of that piece of content. For this, you go into Ahrefs and you'll need to use the best pages by backlinks report, which ranks the pages of a target website based on their total number of backlinks. You'll find this on the left-hand menu under pages and then best by links. Speaking of links, let's move on to LinkedIn. Here's a cool one from Bernardo. Genie sits in your browser and delivers key insights on people
people in LinkedIn, personality insights, lookalikes, and other crispy information. It's mostly an HR tool, but you could also use it to analyze the personality of your sales prospects or understand your target audience better. In other LinkedIn news, did you know that LinkedIn has just introduced video ads? Speaking of new ad formats, have you seen that Google was currently testing placing paid ad formats in the middle of organic results? That's kind of new. And let me take one step back into LinkedIn. Thanks to Jean for sharing this link to LinkedIn's developer plugins. We're thinking about adding some of these plugins directly into our wall of love. This can be really good for social proof or for enriching a web page. Now on to another subject. Let's talk about experimentation. Now when running experiments, I can't stress enough how important it is to calculate the financial implications of experiments. Why? Because you should test stuff that matters. And very often what actually matters is what's linked to the bottom line of the organization. And sometimes it's the easiest experiments that have the biggest impact on the bottom line. For example, here's a hypothesis. Improving website speed is going to increase conversions. Well, that's been proven again and again, and there's usually low hanging fruit on how to improve website speed. Here's a very interesting calculator from Google that will show you the average monetary impact of improving your website speed. This is kind of cool and small and nifty. We're actually working on a bigger financial implication calculator, which we'll share in a future video. So don't forget to subscribe so you get it as soon as we push it out there. Speaking of compliance and stakeholders and running experiments, I'd like to share an amazing tool by our friends at Firmhouse called Airstrip. Airstrip is a compliant tool that allows you to run experiments in a corporate environment. Compliant landing page builder, customer data storage, and much, much more. Check out their page and ask for a demo. Now, behavioral psychology is actually one of the most important aspects of running experiments that work. Understanding cognitive biases, how habits work, how to get through attentional filters. Thanks to Steph for sharing digitalpsychology.io, which you could summarize as a sort of mashup of Robert Cialdini, Dan Ariely, and Nir Eyal. It covers the nine basic principles of behavioral psychology, which we use in marketing and growth, and it might avoid you reading those six or seven books. Speaking of psychology, I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into the brain right now. Where do these biases stem from, from a more biological, from a more mechanical point of view? I research this a lot, and I watch a lot of lectures, and I'd like to recommend this specific one by Robert Sapolsky. My favorite part is discovering the area in the brain responsible for conscientiousness, the frontal cortex. It seems that the frontal cortex is responsible for self-control, impulse control, gratification postponement, and inhibition. It sends inhibitory messages to the amygdala, and the amygdala, on the other hand, is responsible for fear, for impulse, for the need for instant gratification. Amazing talk, check it out. Speaking of the brain and how it works, let's talk just a little bit about mindfulness. We all know about meditation apps like Calm, or at Growth Tribe, one of the perks that we offer is that everybody gets access to a Headspace account. Here's another type of meditation that's guided by Alan Watts, and I really fell in love with this one over the last month. Check it out, and happy meditation. Speaking of mindfulness, we all hate long meetings at Growth Tribe. One of our company values is data levels all arguments. If you bring data to a meeting, it usually makes the meeting a lot shorter. There's less fluffy discussion and more decision making. And why do we want shorter meetings? Because they cost time, and time is our scarcest resource. So thanks to Stefan for sharing how much does this meeting pay. It's a cool tool that helps you calculate how much each meeting actually costs. I'd recommend using it in your next five or six meetings. It's a lot of fun to do. Okay, now let's do a little bit of reading. In the previous episode, we totally forgot to mention the Stackies Awards, and we actually check this out every single year. It's a fantastic, fast way of seeing which marketing technology tools companies are using at the moment. Still on recommended quick reading, check out this link for some of the latest stats on digital shared by Hootsuite, and there's some even more specific stats if you're located in Europe. Here's another amazing piece of reading. Andrew Chen shared the top 20 essays that you should read if you're into marketplaces with supply and demand. Here's another really nice one. Jean and Luke were out in Boston for the inbound conference, and they shared this Google Drive file where everyone shares notes of the top talks that they saw. There's some really nice gems in here. For example, Beth Comstock sharing her 72010 rule for allocation of time and resources, focus 70% on what's now, 20% on what's next, and 10% on what's new. And here's also a very nice little gem from Victor Milligan on what the new role of the CMO should be and how to fight complacency as a CMO. By the way, in these notes, you'll see a lot of bit.ly links that were shared by speakers. Did you know, and thanks to Julia for sharing this one, that by simply adding a little plus at the end of a bit.ly link, you can see how many shares that bit.ly link has received. So for example, in this case, I could see how many people actually clicked on that bit.ly link during the conference. Cool little trick, I bet you didn't know this one. Still reading, thanks to Thomas for sharing that Apple became the first company to hit the one trillion dollar mark in the modern economy. I also learned that the most valuable company of all time was actually the Dutch West Indies company that was valued at seven trillion at the height of the tulip bubble. And thanks also to Julia for pointing out that Amazon just reached 50% of all US e-commerce sales. And if you're one of the people selling on Amazon, thanks to Julia for sharing Jungle Scout, which is probably the most powerful Amazon research tool out there. Check out this small demo to see how it works. If you prefer being independent and you sell through a Shopify store, thanks to Julia for 
sharing kit. It's like a free virtual employee. Kit will recommend the marketing activities most likely to drive sales, for example, by sending emails. It's also a nice tool because it sends you private messages on Facebook, summing up how much you actually sold during a specific period of time. Okay, we're still reading some articles right now. Thanks to Aurelian for sharing this one. It's heat map analysis of job description. So if you want to know what to spend most of your time on, it seems to be salary, role description, and qualifications. Really interesting, and we hadn't seen this type of study before. Speaking of job descriptions and job applications, I'm gonna segue into pictures, pictures that you use on your social networks or on resumes. Here's an awesome tool to judge your profile picture. It basically asks a group of online people to judge your profile pic, either for professionalism or for attractiveness. Give it a spin, it's free if you judge other people. This feels like hot or not all over again. Okay, now let's dive a little bit into machine learning. Did you know that the world's greatest job is no longer data scientist? Or at least I think so. It's now the analytics translator. Check out this video by Bernardo where he explains the why and the how of analytics translators. Still on the subject of machine learning and data sets, here's an awesome new feature delivered by Google and recommended by Bernardo. Google's data search allows you to search for data sets. I played around with this quite a bit and they've got tons of data sets. Anything from public toilets in Manchester to global competitiveness reports. This is also in line with another Google feature that you might want to check out. It's called google.com slash public data slash explore and it's a huge collection of public data sets. So if you're running competitive analysis, looking for internationalization, a lot of data is stored there and could be interesting for you. Now we're going to go into image recognition. Thanks to Ferdinand for sharing this one. It's called Move Mirror and it's kind of nifty. It's a motion recognition engine that detects your skeleton through your webcam and then matches your movement with a huge database of online images. So basically it creates a short clip of people making the same movement through lots of different pictures. Check it out, it's fun to play around with. We've shared some image recognition libraries and tools in previous episodes. Here's a new one from Amazon. You can upload a picture and see if the algorithm can detect objects and emotions within the picture. Need to use it for your app or your product? Like all of these services, they have an API. And thanks to Ferdinand for this one. This is a fantastic fun exercise to better understand image recognition and image classification. Follow the guide that's on the website and you can use some of their data sets to run through the steps. And now for something random. Are you feeling a little bit nostalgic? Do you want to dive into the past? Thanks to Jean for sharing this GitHub repository where you can download Windows 95. So of course, I downloaded it, started playing Solitaire, started using Paint, check it out, lots of fun. And for some reason, I can't uninstall it. I just love having this icon in my dock. Okay, now for some random stuff. Here's the two worst examples of dark UX that I've seen over the past weeks. Here's a company asking you to click on the big blue button or die, basically. And here's a flashlight asking me for access to my whole life. On second thought, uh, no. Let's talk about speed typing very briefly. Camille is the fastest typer I know, and he recommended typing test where you can check how fast of a typer you are. Thanks for Julia for sharing this tool. We create a lot of customer journeys and sort of funnels. Funnelytics allows you to create funnel flows. So we use draw.io currently because it integrates with Google Drive, but Funnelytics seems to be a much more flexible option and the funnels are just, well, a little bit prettier. Here's another great tool from Julia. Sorry, it only works on Mac. By doing control, command, and space, you can add emoticons into any tool that you're currently using. Thanks to Adriana for telling us that one of our favorite tools, Phantom Busters, has some new Instagram features, like an Instagram profile scraper, an Instagram follower collector, or an Instagram following collector. And finally, my new obsession, this one's quirky. Thanks to Pierre for sharing this. This is actually not new, it's from five years ago, and it's probably the greatest Chrome extension ever created. Encage allows you to turn almost every single image in your browser into a picture of Nicolas Cage. It's perfect for hours of cage admiration or for pranking your colleagues. Here's our landing page with Encage, and here's an article from The Economist. Awesome, if you want the list of tools and resources, follow this link, and as always, subscribe to the channel to support us, and don't hesitate to leave a comment about your favorite tool. And we'll see you really soon.